I was still in college when I stopped drinking, but like I had all these aspirations and goals that like sober me really wanted to achieve. And I just couldn't see, like there was such a between me achieving those yeah. things and like being able to, mm. and like putting in the like long-term versus just yeah. like the short-term rewards of just like going on a mad one, having a great time. That just always took my attention instead of being like, right, if I just like take away all these distractions and put my head down and work towards mm. what I want. And I mean, like that's the thing I like, now where I'm at is I have a great job and you know, like I run a studio, all that kind of stuff. And and I never could have been here had I not stopped drinking. Welcome to the podcast, Hannah McGlynn. It is great to have you back for your second visit to these hollow halls. People still tell me that they listen to the first one for inspiration whenever they're trying to not drink too much. So hopefully we can bring bring a bit more of that maybe yeah, for people this new year. that energy. Mm. <laughs> The way, yeah, the way of the sober samurai. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, for a bit of context, I, um, I did the last year, 365 days off the drink. I thought that was really impressive. And then my barber earlier was like, oh, I've been off it for seven years. And I was like, ah, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> he just didn't, didn't seem to give a shit. I was like, oh, cool. But um, oh. yeah, I wanted to touch base with you and just talk about, I suppose, things I've learned and you are a great guide for me. I really admire what you've done as well, quitting drinking, and that's given me some kind of inspiration and uh, a way forward at times. So that's why uh, this is my cards on the table, I suppose, for this conversation um, mm. to start off well, with. Thank you so much for having me back. It's been, it's been yeah. about two years since the last one, is it? Since my last confession. I actually think it has been, yeah, probably was. Yeah. Jesus, was it the pandemic? I think so, yeah. I think we were like locked at mm. home at the time. So. I think we actually were. So that's interesting as well, because we've now been released into the world and we're <laughs> socializing with people and uh, trying to do it without drinking. I'm sure loads of other people that are listening as well. Maybe they've done dry January. Maybe they're kind of thinking about it. Maybe for a little bit of context, they could talk about, I mean, I decided to do the year off because... I was just kind of sick of being drunk and hung over and engaging in foolishness a lot of the time, mm. which is something I kind of noticed about drinking is like, it, it didn't make me a better person. I found I, mm. I was constantly struggling with that and um, enjoying doing it, but also the results not being so good. Mm -hmm. But yeah, maybe if you want to give some context to people about your experience on it and, you know, where you're coming from well thank you so i am now i'm coming up on being six years off the drink which is bizarre like in april it'll nice. be six years so yeah because that's the thing i think the last time i was coming up on my four-year anniversary yeah. and i feel like even since then i've learned a lot like it's been a yeah. it's been a journey and i think you know the longer you off it you are the stronger you are in some ways mm. but let me think so context i gave up drinking yet yeah, nearly six years ago so at the time I was 22 only all you baby and yeah I was just going through that same thing of like I really enjoyed drinking I never thought that it was an issue I thought it was kind of one of the only good things in my life um but you know I couldn't deal with the hangovers and the actual like mental effects that I was getting from mm. it now I couldn't correlate the like depression I was going through to like <laughs> the chemicals that are depressants that I was putting in myself. Like I completely I literally, was just like- So many people that are like are talking to her, they're like, man, I just feel so bad at Christmas. I don't know what it is. Like I just have all this anxiety. I'm like, you've been drinking for like 10 days. <laughs> like you're, yeah. this is the side effect of drinking is anxiety and depression. Like that's what it does. But yeah, it's so we hard have to, to disconnect. Kind of like, join the two, man. You're like, oh, I must be, I'm, I'm sick or I've, I had a bad burger or something like it. You're like, well. Yeah probably the session but yeah sorry i shouldn't be interrupting you no no you're so fine no um this is a conversation um mm. but let me think so yeah so when i went um when i went off the drink i had gone to have like um i basically my doctor had put me on to go and be seen in paths so for like i thought it would just be to kind of like to see a therapist or something and i went and did a whole like psychiatric evaluation which took about four hours. And at the end of it, they were like, you, know, you have all this like PTSD and trauma and everything, but on top of that, of that, you have like issues with like substance abuse and alcohol. And we recommend you come in and do a month long alcohol um, and substance, you know, I guess like a rehabilitation program. And I was gobsmacked. So I was like, 
me like you should see my mates you think I should be in there like what about <laughs> everyone I know like that makes no sense to me and I just thought that like I I remember being so shocked and then coming out and telling my mom and I think that was really hard for her too because you know I was her like 20 to 22 year old little daughter being like this is what I need to go and do now and at the time I was meant to be going to New York for a J1 with all my friends and I was like oh like I don't want to go and do that like you know I want to go to New York um and you know live my hot girl life or whatever but I had ended up making the decision after a month they gave me like a month and a half to choose and also they needed to get you know a bed together and stuff so um yeah I made my decision after it took me like a week but I, even in talking to my close friends at the time they were all like you don't need to do that because like them admitting that I needed to do that meant that they probably if we were all kind of on the same level they probably needed to something or you know it was a reflection mm. of like their own drinking or issues around that so um yeah I went in and I ended up in there for three months which I thought I was told initially I'd be in for a month and it was actually three months in the end and yeah like it changed my life I had to go to AA twice a week and then another program Life Ring once a week which is uh Life Ring is like similar to AA but you just focus on the week uh, behind you and the week ahead of you and like how you're going to stay clean in that time and yeah I mean initially like the first like week or two I was like I'm going to do this program even though I don't need it but just do it so I can get like the psychology I need to do done and I had this real penny drop I think it was like a week or two in of being like oh this this isn't normal the way that myself and all the people around me are living is actually not normal yeah when you look at like the wider society of like the world it's just that within our culture we're just so like but this is what everyone does this is fine yeah man so true and so yeah and then it was actually the the moment that I actually had um in AA and stuff they say like that you should never say to yourself like I'm never going to drink again because it's very hard to actually even come to terms with that and for a lot of people mm-hmm. that's what like knocks them off it so you know the one day at a time kind of is more I don't know it's better mm-hmm. for a lot of people but um I was sitting in it was an AA open meeting and there was a woman I think she was about 28 and at the time also I was listening to these people in AA who were all you know in their kind of like 50s 60s whose lives I couldn't really relate to so much and whose mm-hmm. stories I couldn't relate to so much and yeah this this gal she talked about you know how she went from like you know drinking in her teenage years you know drinking in fields and that and drinking her nagins and all and then to you know the kind of binge drinking that I would have been going through and the kind of she was really much like describing where I was currently at and then from that point you know then how it got worse was you know as you get to the point that we are now you know you're young working professionals and life gets stressful you have a glass of wine in the evening that escalates to vodka that escalates and escalates and escalates and you know that she was on this invisible chaos machine it's the kind of reference I always use and she couldn't see that like everything around her was falling apart and she couldn't see why but she was like Mm. consistently fueling the invisible chaos machine and um (laughs) with drink like with alcohol yeah like completely yeah like being like why does it have fuel while you're also there fueling it? You know, just um, pouring drinking. Mm. Yeah, and just and still being like shocked by the outcomes, you know, when you're consistently, you know, yeah. doing the same thing. So um, that was the first time that I was like, whoa, like, and basically she had talked about her periods of sobriety she had had and then how she'd be like, oh no, I've learned to drink better now. Now I'll be able to yeah. go back. And how for her anyway, and I think for me as well, because I've had brief periods before this, um, you think, oh, yeah, I'll take a break and then I'll be able to go back with fresh eyes and be better. But like when those yeah. patterns and behaviors are in you and once you lose your inhibitions, you're kind of guaranteed the same outcome every time. So that was the start of me really like, you know, it took a while as well. But make, coming to terms with the fact that like actually drinking probably isn't for me at all. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's a hard realization, though, to be honest, because it's something I'm wrestling with at the moment. Having like, I was like, I'm going to do the year, and then everybody's like, When are you starting drinking again? Like, everybody's like, Are you coming yeah. out? People are like, like, Oh, I won't see you at Christmas. We can meet up in January when you're drinking again, kind of thing. And you're like, uh. I've kind of learned. I mean, I've seen the wheel go round enough, and I think watch people drinking to see now the kind of self deception that's involved in it a lot of the time, which is like, Oh, it's fine. I'm doing this, but 
it's kind of a thing that takes you to the same place every time. Like you'll drink in different occasions, but you just, if you get too drunk, you're going to habitually repeat it. I always think about where it's like, you're trying to control yourself with a substance that specifically makes it difficult to control yourself. It's like a game of chicken with your own willpower because (laughs) the thing like you, what you'd use to control your behavior is being damaged by the drinking. So I don't, I, I don't trust it anymore. Like I do, part of me does want to, you know, see friends and have a couple of pints and enjoy it. But another part of me sees that like invisible chaos machine and just really can't deny it. Did you come up with the invisible chaos machine or is that something they taught you in the AA? I think it was either, it was either that woman or it was someone in AA. I remember when I heard it in mm. that, like, yeah. I don't know, in that kind of description, I was just like, that was what resonated with me the most. But I was just like, because mm. I kept being like, my life is falling apart, my life's in shit, like, and I, I just don't understand what I'm doing wrong. But like, you are the chaos, like, you're, you're sitting on top of this chaos machine that's like destroying everything, but you're fueling it. And I just, yeah. no, I think it's a great descriptor for it. So it's like, you're so not good. like consciously doing all these things wrong. And even like, that's the mm. thing, so many people aren't conscious of like, with the chemical effects of alcohol that, you know, I think mm. it's up to 10 days or seven days after you have like a drink, you can be feeling the antidepressant effects. But like, yes, when you're sad, you can't actually relate that back to that. You're just like, no, I'm sad because my life's a shambles. It's you can't so be weird. Like, the chemicals. <laughs> it's the sneakiest effect that I, cause I've, I completely vibe with that myself. Like I remember me, me and my friend James, who you know as well, we used to be like, on a, like after a weekend of drinking, you'd be like, why, why have I been cursed like this? Like, why, why God, why do I feel this way? And you're like, well, you know, we just drank loads of beers and have been, you know, out for two days. Obviously this is going to happen, but it makes it very, it's very hard to recognize that that's the problem and go, yeah, it's this, because I think it requires like really radical change. Did you find that when you first took it off, like it revealed all the things in your life that weren't put together? Like for me, I noticed like, oh, I'm papering over a lot of stuff with this that makes me comfortable when I actually don't feel comfortable a lot of the time. Oh, yeah. Like I, mm. one of the things that was, I think the hardest thing for me to come to terms with. And like one of the things that made it so hard for me to stop, particularly, you know, I was 22, mm. that I was like, I kept saying this thing of being like, no, like, the, the me that all my friends love and all the people around me love is the like me when I'm like drinking or I'm partying, like she's mm. so like fun. And like, I had this other version of myself that I was like, I could never in my sober self go out and be around people like that or like go on nights out mm. because I need that as mm. like a social lubricant. Cause sure, you know, we mm. started drinking when we were what, 13, 14. So we were socialized through alcohol and never really learned yeah. those proper communication skills. To actually be able mm. to hold a conversation with another person and not feel awkward or uncomfortable. And <sighs> so initially it was like having all of that removed and being like, right now, off you go. Um, which is hard. And like, I think a lot of the people I know now are really who are doing like dry January and stuff or who are starting off on like, you know, even sober curiosity and um, mm. find that the biggest struggle because you're so used to being like, oh, I feel a little sexy, have a little pint, you know, like. <laughs> And then, and then they're just like, yep. hello, I am the me that is like, you know, in my day to day in work or whatever. Yep. Yeah. You don't get that transformation. Like you don't have the instant, just like two, three, you're like, oh, I feel a bit awkward, but if I have two pints, then I'll be getting going and it'll be fine. You have to yeah. kind of get over the hump yourself. And that like, that discourages me a lot of the time, to be honest. Like I socialize. I was looking over, like, I did, like, an annual review of, like, the last year of stuff, <laughs> like, productivity bro shit, but um, yeah. just looking at, like, what went well, what did I do, what was good, and then I was, like, looking through, and I was, like, I think I went out probably, like, a fraction of the amount of times that I would have done. I did more last year, I accomplished more, I think, than I had any other year in recent memory, but my socializing dipped dramatically, like, a lot, yeah. because even when I was going out, I was staying till 10, maybe 11. And then I was going home and like, I wasn't there till three, four in the morning. Like there wasn't that amount, but I was able, I, I didn't have any FOMO. I wasn't like, oh shit, that was, I didn't miss it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I did notice this change. And like, if I didn't have something else to do, it would have been very hard, I think. Because like, if you take away the drinking and don't replace it with anything, 
you're just kind of, you know, sitting around. <laughs> like, I think you need, it reveals that the purpose and the need for something you're passionate about or that you're even just dedicating time to, I think. Completely, honestly. And that's saying mm -hmm. there's such a void when you actually look at, this is another thing I had to do in treatment was, you know, to look at all of the time you would have spent drinking and, you know, calculate those hours roughly and to be mm -hmm. like, right, so you would have spent, say, 20 hours a week drinking. You had a part-time job in the drinking. And if you're not going to fill that with something that is like positive or, you know, whether that's like a hobby or an activity or even just like making sure you go and see friends or whatever it is, then something else, if you have particularly addictive behaviors or like self-sabotaging behaviors, something else mm -hmm. is going to fill that gap for you. And, yep. you know, so it is really important. But that, that's the hardest thing I think about it because then you're sitting there and you're like, right, I'm not drinking anymore need to find something mm. oh i'm gonna start pottery and <laughs> we're looking for like the instant gratification thing as well because yep. like you know mm. you feel instantly good initially when you're like having your drinks or whatever yep. and like most things in life don't provide you with that same instant thing it is unfortunately mostly yep. only the things that are bad for us that give us that that dopamine yeah. literally yeah, yeah. Flow, so. flow states. That was something that I realized as well this time was flow states. Like you need that kind of losing self-consciousness, like when you drink and you just become immersed in everything that's going on. You're not thinking, you're not worrying about stuff. Like mm. that's really, it's a curative kind of state. But if you don't have that anywhere in your life, the drinking becomes a way of kind of getting into that mode. But like with the pottery example, like maybe the person that's done pottery for 10 years probably gets into a flow state the minute they see a bit of pottery like they're like sweet i'm in the zone but when you first start yeah. off you're gonna suck so it's not gonna be like you're not gonna get into a kind of rhythm at all but i think the thing you can replace drinking with is flow states bad ones yeah. like addictions or good ones like exercising like something generally it's something i think you have to have a certain amount of experience in a certain amount of skill but you have to be developing the skill like martial arts for me like sparring you're in a flow state instantly because mm. you're paying loads of attention you're not kind of distracted you're not self-conscious and you're building up you know your skill level day by day but if you don't have that you're going to be getting all your flow from 18 pints of Guinness in the bulb, like, yeah. and it's that's so, not going to be good. Thing, you know, when you first, like, I struggle with this even now, like, I really don't like, I think most people don't like being bad at something, but I expect to be yeah. instantly good at something from the second I start it. <laughs> so, like, you look yeah. at yourself, you're like, I'm not drinking for this month, I'm going to take mm. up pottery, and you're not instantly yep. good. It already feeds into that, like, cycle of shame you're having of being like, I'm a piece of shit, I'm not good at anything, I can't even make a bowl. You know, I like, suck at pottery. I'm a failure uh, as a human being. Just yeah, go straight pottery up, was like. actually the thing. When I was in treatment, I mm. wasn't allowed to leave the building for the first month and a half. Um, mm. And, you know, I was just like bored out of my mind. And it's, you know, coming into the summertime, everyone's out drinking pints. I was like, mm, feeling real sorry for me. And there was a pottery room. So yeah. I started making ashtrays. And um, <laughs> no, it was man. really therapeutic for me. And it made me realize as well the importance of also channeling. If you are a creative person, if you're not that creative, that like a creative outlet can be so healing. Something that you can like sit there and be, you know, like meditative, pensive, whatever it is. And like, like that, get into that flow state. But doing it without, um, what's the word? Without expectation, you know? Yeah. Because we're not going to... The creative thing reminds me so much of like the, the invisible chaos machine. That was something I, I realized about myself. I was like, as a creative person, like if things are going well, I'll kind of destroy it just because I want to do something else. Like I'll throw the toys out of the pram or I'm very like, I find it very hard to kind of add structure to my life and discipline and things like that. I think a lot of creative people do end up kind of in, on the session or in kind of addictive loops because you have a lot of energy and like if you're not channeling into creative work it becomes chaos it's uh yeah. i think it's stephen pressfield the war of art he talks about like how people become characters like these weird zany characters in life and he's like that's creative energy that hasn't been channeled into creative work so your life becomes your work basically like mm. you have all these crazy dramas going on and everything's all like you know there's mad stuff every week and it's like a soap opera but that's because you have creative energy that's not going anywhere and so you're using yeah. it on yourself essentially 
Yeah. And you know, it, mm. so another thing that I, we have been talking about this earlier, but, um, so that I, I was diagnosed with ADHD last year. And, um, yeah. one of the things with that is that people with ADHD are typically very creative types. And, yeah. um, also people with ADHD, because you are dopamine deficient, like your brain, one of the things with that's what I was going to, yeah, yeah the low dopamine hypothesis. Dopamine. So it's mm. something like, I can't remember what the statistics were. It's something like if you have ADHD, you're three to five times more likely to suffer with addiction. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Because, yeah, you're just looking for, like, that, that instant dopamine fix. Yeah. Um, so that's another thing, that people are typically creative and, like, mm. that typically maybe a little bit outgoing or whatever it is and can fall into addiction. And, like, that it's if you're yeah. not getting the treatment or whatever it is that you need, mm. that you're just constantly looking for dopamine in risky behavior. Which Self-medicating. Right that was, yeah. yeah. I read that the low dopamine hypothesis by TJ Spencer um which was in 2015, he did mm. the first paper on it that was like, one of the things, one of the ways they figured it out was people with ADHD typically did more recreational drugs and they thought it was because like, oh, you can't focus or whatever, you're more impulsive. But it was actually turned out that it was because of self-medicating because like if you are have low dopamine and you do recreational drugs, you feel normal. <laughs> like you don't, yeah. you're not even getting high. You actually just feel better and you're like, oh, this is great. Like I actually feel like how I want to feel. So you're more likely to get caught in this loop of, you know, abusing different substances because that's how Ritalin works as well. I mean, they're like designed to increase levels of dopamine in the brain, but obviously in a medically advised way. <laughs> yeah. So you're not just like winging it. But, Completely yeah. like the medication I'm on, it's a, it's a different mm. amphetamine, so it's not Ritalin. But um, yeah. yeah, I remember initially I was very resistant to that because I was like, oh, no, like I struggle with addiction. Like I can't be on mm. an amphetamine. Um, yeah. But it's like the way that it works in some of that issue brain is that like something mm. that, yeah, would send someone else like up the walls just makes you like normal and be able to focus and like yep. actually feel at ease. And in actual fact, instead of making you crave things and feel like, oh, I need to do X, Y, Z, because mm. you're getting that dopamine fix, you don't feel mm. the same need to even like, for example, use or like engage mm. in risky things. Or I just know yeah. my impulsivity went way down. Yeah, stocks are yeah. way down after going on that. Um, yeah, even like yeah. the amount of tattoos I got, I've gotten since that really plummeted. Like some of these really? things that are yeah, interesting. yeah, I just haven't had the need or felt the mm. need to do um, as many reckless things anymore. Which is yeah, interesting. but it's so interesting because like you can you can be in that state like the same way at the drinking and like you, you don't notice it almost. We tend to think these we equate these things to, like who we are and like this is what I do and this is how. I live, but then you realize, oh, I, you know, I have a chemical deficiency in my brain. <laughs> like that's yeah. actually creating a lot of these negative behavior, but like, or, or positive one. I mean, but it's hard to kind of, I, the dopamine one, I think is going to be like the most important thing in the 21st century, to be honest, because like all the stuff I'm doing on like social media and smartphones, like smartphones have been shown to cause ADHD now yeah because they're so rewarding in young kids that they develop habits and if you develop a habit for it under the age of nine it's very hard to break it apparently so they're habitually giving themselves higher than normal rewards and their do their dopamine level is dropping below baseline and their body's not producing it so you're going to be in a state that's well you're not just you're not going to enjoy things you know you're not going to have motivation or um any kind of pursuit emotion but to have that self-awareness, I suppose, to kind of figure out what was it that made you kind of pursue the diagnosis or was there, or was it something that you kind of just found out? So it was, um, so funnily enough, I went, when I was like 18, I, that was one of my like biggest bouts of depression and really suicidal and everything at the time. And I just felt like, I think I felt like such an alien. And even then I remember doing lots of like research and everything and being like, no, I must have this. And I went to my doctor at the time, who was not a great doctor. And she basically just said, no, you're just, you're being lazy. You're not focusing. Or I, I said I couldn't focus. I see my leaving cert and everything. And she was like, focus is something that is learned, not given. And that you need mm. to like work on that. And uh, which was a real smack in the face. So then I was just like, oh no, I'm just <laughs> yeah. a piece of shit. That is interesting. I and suck. Then, that's the problem. Yeah, that's exactly it. And then, and funnily enough, with the whole ADHD thing, I think people with ADHD gravitate to other people with ADHD or like other neurodivergent people because they're like, oh, you get me. Like you are mm -hmm. also a bit, um, 
out of the norm or the neurotypical world mm. and you know you're typically creative or like that in circles mm. of addiction all these things so yeah. i would always thought i was quite normal and um, yeah. the more i kind of started to observe those things and i think adhd things also kept coming back into my algorithm and the more i saw them i'd be like oh, oh yeah. well, everyone's like that and i started to realize like no mm. not everyone's like that uh, but a lot of the people i'm yeah. surrounded by are like that so, um and I've been going through a bit of a bad spell uh, mentally last year and mm. I just wanted some sort of change. So I've this kind of felt like the answer for me. So mm. I went to my doctor and I was really ready this time to like defend it to the ground. And I know women are chronically underdiagnosed with ADHD as well. So I was ready to fight my corner <laughs> and it was a different mm. doctor, fortunately. And yeah, she basically did a, like an assessment for me in order to refer me. And after doing the assessment, she was like, I think you do kind of fit the characteristics of someone with ADHD. And luckily her son had it. So she was very like empathetic towards me. And then, yeah, I was referred on to a psychiatrist. And usually mm -hmm. like the process can take a long time. And unfortunately in Ireland, so many people were not diagnosed. You know, we were just labeled bold kids when you were in school. So, um, yeah. So yeah, so there's so many people out there looking for diagnosis. So the waiting lists are like long. So I was expecting mm. to wait, you know, about a year or so for that, but I was just happy to have started the process. And then fortunately a psychiatrist got back to me the next week and was like, I have a cancellation today. Can you come in? So we ran mm. and yeah, within an hour of this whole like uh, assessment thing, he was like, yep, yeah, you have ADHD. Which is one of those mm. really strange things of being like, now what? <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> yeah. what do i do i still gotta concentrate like, yeah, gonna, like this I isn't gonna help yeah. yeah and like mm. i wanted it for so long and then went and sat in my car and it was this whole like i was so upset but also so relieved and then spent the next couple of months kind of going through this whole process of kind of nearly like grieving and then anger and then you know initially was so happy and was like great i'm motivated to do these things and then why wasn't this noticed when I was younger? My life could have been so different. It's so unfair. Mm -hmm. And then uh, being like, oh, no, now this is actually like a death sentence because the things that I thought that were little problems in my life that now all, you know, fall under this umbrella together. Mm -hmm. uh, like they're not just things I can sort out. They're things that are, you know, typical of someone with a brain like mine. Um, so it's been a big, uh, a big thing for me in the last year. Yeah, um, it's a big change. It reminds me, there's an interesting, I wonder, did they have you do a personality test at all to do with it? Because there's an interesting kind of crossover between the ADHD literature and personality psychology, because people mm. with ADHD typically would have, be more creative, they'd have more negative emotion, and they'd have lower conscientiousness, because conscientiousness is your ability to ignore distractions. Um, and so if you're creative, you're constantly having ideas and you're constantly interested in things. And then conscientiousness is the ability to suppress that, basically. They're like complete antagonistic because attention has two networks, which is the task network, which is goal directed and the default mode network, which is expanding. It's like mind wandering. Like, so if you're a creative mm -hmm. person, you're mind wandering all the time. Like that's what, and in school, they're like, fucking stop doing that. And you're like, no, that's literally who I am. <laughs> like, I can't, yeah. I can't turn that off. But like, that's not going to work. It's a big, I think more and more we're going to see like that people can't fit into the educate because like it, I was talking to my sister about it and she was like, oh no, it's like, she was like, it's, it's to do with a problem in the brain. But I was like, but it's also a problem with the fact that we're expected to sit in a thing for like eight to 10 hours and read and that's completely abnormal for human beings. Like we, we don't do that. Like that's a very yeah. recent thing. And we're expecting everybody to do that. Even if a person who is much more active and much more suited for dealing with people or dealing with, you know, situations where they're more tactile or they're more like, we're trying to just force everybody through the same narrow gate. And people aren't like that. Like we're individuals, we have unique yeah. skills and it needs to be more. I think the education system is probably going to have to be, completely kind of overhauled at some point but it yeah for people like yeah with adhd or that problem for so many young guys as well like that just they fail in school and then they feel like oh i'm a failure like i guess my life is i'm a bold person or i'm not a good person or i'm not good at these things and you get a negative self-image and that follows you forever like and it's just because you should have been somewhere else like it's a different yeah. 
it's not your fault like and that you're being held to the same mm. you know you're being expected to meet these same marks that like mm. people who are like neurotypical can meet and then you're mm. always going to fall short and you're always going to go into this like like I went through so many little like shame cycles of being like I cannot exist as a human being which fed so much also mm. into my depression. So it was like in this like tandem thing of feeling yeah. really like othered and feeling really like, mm. how do you function within society? And then, mm. oh, isn't this great? I can go and drink and do all these other things, you know, to yeah. self-medicate once again, yeah. or just to feel better in myself and to feel more mm. normal and to feel more alike my peers. Um, <sighs> Man. Yeah. So the rabbit hole goes deep. <laughs> Well, that's, I mean, that was to our earlier point, like when you take away the drinking, you kind of have to really think about those things. And your niche, I think, is so important. That's something I've really been thinking about. And the internet kind of does that a lot where you have to define yourself all the time. You have to say, I'm this person and I'm into this thing. And this is, you know, the self-branding kind of aspect. But yeah, you do, I think for people to find their niche, you get a sense of satisfaction. It's a real problem if you feel like you're not in the right place in your life or where you are and there's so like I've been there myself and I know there's so many people that are feeling that disconnect between where we are culturally and where we are in our individual lives like there's going to be a lot of uh, hardships I think and addiction is one way of coping with that which doesn't yeah. work it makes it worse but and have you found um, like I think I've found you know like I'm 28 now I think you're you're probably 28 too I'm 28 you? yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. like um the thing i was kind of talking about earlier as well of like when we were like younger obviously and we were drinking mm. and that like you didn't notice yeah. it as much i think in people with like the yeah. way that they were like yeah people were like wild and partying but they were yeah like in college and that and you don't have that many responsibilities and everything yep whereas now it's starting to really show in terms of like you can actually start to see it in people like some of the mm. people i know you can like see that they drink a lot or that um yeah you know, that they're trying to keep all these plates balanced while also like trying to manage an addiction or just that they're sad. Yeah. 100%. And you're trying to maintain, because like you can't drink all the time and have a functioning adult life. Like I, that was a big deal for me and Quentin was like, this is taking up too much time. Like it's too, I can't do both these things. So the temptation might be to not take on responsibility or not to take on things that would, you know, more work or relationships or whatever. And to continue drinking the same way, but that's a losing game. Like that only gets harder. I think as you get older and um, yeah. the competition for your time, like, yeah. And it's just like, you know, having all of these, like, this is one thing that, you know, even at the, like when I was, I was still in college and I stopped drinking, but like mm -hmm. I had all these aspirations and goals that like sober me really wanted to achieve. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't see, like there was such a distance between me achieving those yeah. things and like being able to, mm -hmm. and you know, like, putting in the like long-term work versus just yeah. like the short-term rewards of just like going on a mad one, having a great time. That just always took my attention instead of being like, right, if I just like take away all these distractions and put my head down and work towards mm -hmm. what I want. And I mean, like, that's the thing I like now where I'm at is I have a great job and you know, like I run a studio, all that kind of stuff. And I never could have been here had I not stopped drinking. Like I just would never have been capable of this. And I know that mm. which is wild. It's so interesting because I get, yeah, I, I feel exactly the same way. But the difference between that and just the idea of just opening a beer and having a beer at the weekend or something, I'm being like, this is fine. But then you can also see how if that's the routine always, it does limit the scope of the things you can do. Like there's a trade off with everything like you to do one thing is to not do everything else. So mm -hmm. there is that thing to consider with drinking that I think when you get to our age probably becomes more important. I think when you're younger, if you want to, I wonder, that was a question I was going to ask you actually, like, do you feel ashamed of yourself then? Do you feel like, is that a, a source of embarrassment for you that you lived like that? Cause I think for me it has been, but I don't know if that's actually a good thing. So sure. a source of it, like, am I embarrassed for like the person that I was then kind of? Yeah, or... they, they talk about like the shadow self that like there's a part like you've been there's a a part of yourself that you look down on at a time in your life essentially that you want to reject and you want to be like I can't believe I was that person and it becomes like your kind of worst fear in a sense um, and I wonder but then how do you kind of appreciate that person as well because you came out of that person like I find that hard to kind of put in context. 
I don't know yeah. if that makes sense. No, no, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. Uh, and it's interesting. I had a conversation about this recently. Um, mm. So yeah, like one of the things that kind of, like that one is a tricky one because one of the things that does kind of keep me on my straight and narrow and like stops me from drinking is mm. I didn't like the person that I was then and I couldn't stand behind you know, and I mean more like the person I was when I was drunk, like the person I was when I was sober was very different to the person I was when I was drunk. But I, the decisions she would make were not ones that I could ever stand behind. And, mm. you know, I would black out a lot of the time when I was drinking and I would do awful things and I'd hurt the people I love and, you know, make a show of myself. I'd be like loud, like obnoxious, aggressive. And like, that was not the person I wanted to be. And yeah, I, yeah, that's one of the things that caused me so much like shame and fear at that time. But um, so that person, and I think I have vilified her very much so because there are people who mm. know me and yourself, like when I was drinking and when I go on about how awful I was, they're like, oh, you were never that bad. But I think for me, I need to vilify her to be like, I never mm. want to go back there. Um, mm. But then now I'm at a point as well of, I have a lot of compassion for my former self. Like I don't hate mm. or feel ashamed of her because, you know, I was carrying so much trauma. I hadn't done the proper therapy I needed to do at that time. And I was just really hurting. So I think like now I just wish I could send that little girl so much love and, mm. you know, see myself. And I think it's really made me more empathetic as a person to be able to, you know, when you see someone even on the street acting like an arsehole or doing whatever or being rude or whatever it is like that you can try and pull back and be like what is going on in that person's life or you know even when you're on a night out and someone's really like drunk and obnoxious now I'm not like mm. oh god he's a melter I'm like wow for one he could have a problem whether that is like with alcohol chemically or things could be terrible at home or he could be really going through it so um well yes there was a lot of shame um, at that time and I think that's what helped to get me off the drink now I try to be a bit more like compassionate towards myself because mm. I've realized like I am that person still you know even though mm. I've changed massively like I used to act like it was like me then and me now are two completely different entities <laughs> like it's the same vessel <laughs> <laughs> it's just an we're, update. In, we're in the the same soup <laughs> kind of, yeah completely like yeah. this meat suit we share yeah so, um mm. yeah so um that's the thing but like i think as well in the time after um when i was out of paths but i was still going to aa and stuff i started you know trying to do like the steps um and basically the eighth step is making a list of all the people who you've harmed uh with your addiction and then the ninth one is then um, making amends. So, you know, reaching out to those people if it is like safe and you know, won't harm you to do so and apologizing. And um, one thing like I, that was, that's the scariest step, I think, for most people, because, you know, a lot of people in addiction have done bad things. And, you know, the thing of like hurt people hurt people. So um, reaching out to people and apologizing but also having enough time of sobriety under my um under my belt that mm. also I had obviously changed so much and like I am such a different person now that people can say oh well do you know what you've instead of like talking about like oh I can change I can do that like taking those words to action and actually making an effort to change and you know putting in the work and the time that it takes to change um, but everyone who I did reach out to was actually very like understanding and very you know like appreciative of my apology. <laughs> like, but like, sorry, I puked on you that evening. <laughs> my yeah. bad, bro. <laughs> or just yeah, like people who I had done stupid things to that like mm. I just wasn't in a good headspace at the time. And at the time, you can just be like, oh, that person's a fucking arsehole, and they probably had me mm. in that category. And then to reach out and to be like, look, I was in the height of like mental illness and addiction and I really am sorry for what I've done and like I take accountability that the things I did to you were not nice and mm. you know I don't expect forgiveness but I just would like you to know that I'm really sorry and um yeah when you have actually put in the work to try and change or you know just like work on yourself people are very understanding of it so uh mm. so that has been my journey with shame <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I ask, it's kind of a random one. Uh, I, I don't know if you watch it. It's on Netflix. It's called Stutz. It's no, Jonah Hill and his therapist. That. 
Yeah. I was like, I'll throw this on for a bit of a yarn, see what's going on. It's actually great. Really good. Yeah. Um, but he was talking about that in terms of the shadow. I mean, I know the shadow from Jung and that kind of psychoanalytical tradition, but he was talking about like there's a, a version of you inside of you that is rejected, basically, that you've just ignored or that you've pushed down or said that's bad. And um, mm. he advised kind of sitting down with your eyes closed and trying to call that version of you to listen to them, essentially, to hear what they say. And so I did that and I felt like it was me like when I was sessioning wearing Hawaiian shirts and fucking you know, fighting people and selling pingers and doing bad stuff. <laughs> um, so, and I, I just kind of felt like I, I just had nowhere to kind of, I kind of allowed my, to get berated briefly, but, um, but there, there was also good things about like, you know, that version of me that was fun loving and that had a good time with people. And that wasn't always, that might've been a bit much, but, um, I think there's a lot to be said as well for not being too judgmental in drinking or not drinking. Like, I feel like there's a danger of rejecting yourself and rejecting other people and having this kind of complex about it almost like it's, uh, it can be so transformative, but you almost, I don't want to get stuck in this kind of, cause it's hard to, you know, is it, if it's a bad thing, are people that drink bad? <laughs> like, was I bad when I drank? Yeah. Like, or is it one of those kind of indifferent things and it's more how you behave with it? Like, I, I think know. for me anyway, because um, that was the thing I found really difficult and I still do find mm. difficult that um, because I don't drink, I think a lot of people think that I hate people who drink or hate being around drunk people and that I'll have mm. a problem or I'll be like judging them for what they're doing. And it's been like, you know, said to me in the past, mm. being like, oh, but you know, like, I can't be like you. And it's like, I'm not expecting you to be like me. You know, like I, if I could drink and not be an arsehole, I would, you know, like I'd love to be able to sit and have a couple of pints down the pubs with my <laughs> pub with my pals, but I actually am not capable of doing that without creating mm. havoc for myself and just being mm. depressed. So, you know, I admire people who can drink and you know who particularly those who have like a good relationship with it i think it's astounding in this in this country very but impressive yeah it's very impressive people who can nurse pints honestly they are saints amongst men but um, True. champions champions but uh but also it's like that my problem with drinking isn't like alcohol it's like mm. what it did for me so i don't ever mm. look at someone else and think oh god they drink so much like they're a piece of shit I either mm. think like, well, they're having a deadly time or like, mm. I hope they're okay. And I hope like, you know, yeah. and like, that's the thing. If I do notice there's someone in my life who is kind of drinking more and kind of showing more of those signs, like I will kind of be like, is everything okay with you? Like, not <laughs> yeah. you. What's but up? like, it's, yeah, like it's everything chill. But like, I'd never look down on someone who drinks or think about it. Like, honestly, I think alcohol yeah. has its place within society. I know it's obviously very destructive. But um, but no, and it is a hard one though because then it yeah. does get you to that place of being like, it's so unfair. Everyone else can drink, and yeah, it's a really, it's quite difficult. But I guess what you've hit the nail on the head there is that the reasons for not drinking are generally very individual, and I think you can mm. make arguments i mean i don't think we drink properly at all like i don't know anybody i think that really except for a very small group of people who can drink like in any sort of normal way i think what's recommended amount is like four units a week or something like something you, meager you do that in 20 minutes like if yeah. even <laughs> like there's there's some drinks that are four units just in one yeah drink. Um, so i don't think and there's health problems i mean andrew huberman did a really good podcast on the the neuroscience of alcohol and all of the effects on it. And his review of the literature was that there's no health benefits to it whatsoever. Like it's all bad. Like it, mm. it's go because it permeates the cell wall. So it can affect every single organ in your body and has all these kind of physiological changes and things. So I think maybe we should think more about our drinking and think more about your, and I know people are like, oh fuck, another thing I have to think about. Like, are you serious? Yeah. I'm trying to think less. But I think drinking is one of those things like you can, it, it'll, it opens the door to a lot of other problems and yeah. it shouldn't, maybe shouldn't be as casual as we think it is um, to do it I, or not. 
the thing that I've kind of come, um, and it's really been in the last kind of like year or so that's really come my way in like my, my journey around drinking has just been like, that like life is really hard. Like right, life is really, really hard. And you also need to like go easy on yourself because like sometimes some people need whatever it is to get them through the day. Um, but to make sure that that's not the thing that you're living for, obviously, you know, some people that are like, yeah. if I didn't have sessioning, like what would I do? Like, that's obviously, that's a problem. And that's something you need to like assess in yourself because yeah. then you're like, you know, it also feeds into your self-worth. If you don't have anything going on other than like going out and partying with your friends, like sure, that's like fun. But then you'll look back in years, years to come and be like, what did I do though? You know, did fuck all. I didn't yeah. really like work on myself or, you know, like whether it's like hobbies or sports or whatever you like to channel things into. Like, you know, it is important to channel it that way. But at the same time to like not go so hard on yourself is something I try to say to people as well because they're like, oh, like I should just like being around me, they'll be like, oh, like I just wish I could quit drinking like you. And I'm like, but you don't need to. I'm like, you might not necessarily anyway need to like go easy on yourself because also life is there to be lived and like be kind to yourself. But just make sure yeah. that, you know, the benefits to some degree that you're getting from it are, if anything, equal to the negative things or above the negative things. Because if it's yeah. all negative that you're getting from it, like that's, that's when mm. it's a real issue, I think, for just your actual worth as a person and how you feel yeah. in yourself. Yeah, when it's hampering your potential as well. I always think about that quote yeah. where it's like, hell is when the person you could be meets the person you are. Like when you've passed the point of like, oh my God, I've just been, you know, frying my brain for ages and now I have to climb this mountain again. For me, it was very like, I wanted to take away all the kind of comforts that I had, like all the addiction, well, vices, I suppose, that I was using to feel comfortable and avoid like the process of developing into the person I want to be and being on that mm -hmm. path. And that actually involved taking away these things. So I'd say there is a lot of people that need to, confront that and if it's not affecting you you know living the life that you want to be living and you should be living then have at it like go get smashed like it sounds great yeah. but i suspect there's a lot of people that are struggling with that more than they would admit maybe or that is obvious um yeah i it, think the it, admitting yeah. thing that's it it's mm. the acceptance piece and like you know like that's like the first step as well with AA it's like yeah. like coming to a place of acceptance yeah. of being like this is actually a problem for me because like mm. I think the word alcoholic I've said this like the word alcoholic really needs a rebrand because yeah. so many people like even myself I'm like I can't like I feel weird saying like hi I'm Hannah I'm an alcoholic because it doesn't yeah. feel you like, like need I to have am. a beard and like a bottle of wine and yeah, be in a shopping just, cart like, or something yeah, I feel like my behavior doesn't, or like I felt yeah. like anyway, that like my behavior didn't fit in line with what I thought that word meant. And I feel like it's a very like stark word. Yeah. Whereas like, and that's what mm. I think puts so many people off, like accepting like, oh, like I actually have a problem with my drinking. Cause it's yeah. such a like, it feels like such an extreme. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's the acceptance thing. That's also being able to be like, okay, this is creating problems or like that harboring my potential. Um, mm. And yeah, like hurting the people around you as well. I think that's another thing. I was unaware of how much I was hurting those people around me. Like my family were walking on eggshells around me. And uh, my friends like were like irritated by me and annoyed by me. And then also like worried about me. And I couldn't mm. see that. So I was just like, no, I'm being a fun girl. I'm having fun. Um yeah but there's more to life than that it's literally the definition of addiction as well as just a continuous pattern of harmful behavior that harms you or other people like um mm. and so a lot more things qualify as addictions than we think to be honest um which is interesting because sometimes if you take away the drink it might just reveal other problems like they'll just be like oh i have attachment issues and i can't i'm afraid of people so i can't relate to them or i can't have you know intimate relationships so i have to use drink to cover it or it's, yeah. oftentimes i don't think it is the drink itself maybe that's really the issue but um yeah it's something that i think for irish people as well man we're just it's in our dna or something to be just excessively boozing like it is and like even like so have you seen on colin kuhn yet 
Uh, no, but I've heard about it. It's a film, is it? A short film? Yeah, it's a film. It's a gorgeous mm. film. I went to see it in the lighthouse last night and I won't, I won't mm-hmm. add any spoilers. But yeah. um, in it, there's, um, you know, it deals with the theme of addiction and mm. there's a man drinking a pint of Guinness. You know, that kind of like four gulp and it's down and like put down. Down to the G. <laughs> yeah, no, like down to the fucking ground, gone. <laughs> And it was the first time in so long that I then was thinking about drinking a pint. I was like, mm. I was like, wow, I actually haven't tasted that in so long. And my brain, my brain started just kind of going off on that kind of curiosity thing. And like yeah. a craving came to me for being like, oh, I'd love yeah. to just drink a pint again. It's like, yeah. And, which is scary that like, even mm. after nearly six years of not drinking that I like, you know, I think the last time we spoke, I had I wasn't drinking zeros. Now I do drink the zero zeros just because um, to be sociable, mm. and I do enjoy them. But yeah. um, that the thing of complacency can be a very mm. uh, dangerous thing. That you know, it all it takes is like a couple little uh, of those thought patterns. The media, man, like media or like films. It's like if you see somebody smoking in like Pulp Fiction or something, you're like, oh my God, I need to start smoking again. This looks great. Um, I found, I'm uh, reading James Joyce's autobiography at the moment and there's all just these stories of him just getting pissed constantly and like ruining his life. And I'm like, maybe I could have a few pints. Like, <laughs> like oh, maybe it'd be. And you're like, this doesn't, you know, I know what's going to happen, but yeah. it's still some, there's some disconnect at times. I yeah, I know that's thing. It's like so sensationalized. And like, and even like in the film, yeah. the whole like point of that scene was to show how like sad this man was. And mm. I'm like, wow. <laughs> that <laughs> like pint is sick. <laughs> yeah, like sick, I want a pint. Like that is so like yeah. insidiously like, in our minds, mm. in our like DNA, like, um, Fuck, man. yeah, yeah. Um, and was it you touched on the, previously that you were saying that there was even in the last kind of two years since we last spoke, there's things that you'd learned about it. Is there anything else that you think would be useful for people, even any insights that you've had, um, that we haven't touched on? Had. Interesting, um. <laughs> Hmm. more insights I definitely have what, what else have I learned um, I think the being kind to myself thing has been one of the main ones definitely <laughs> in terms of like I had even I think maybe when we last spoke I was still this way that I was vegan um, I wasn't drinking and I was trying to go up smoking and I was so like trying to cancel absolutely everything that I saw as negative out of my life and, you know, being like, oh, and then I will have the perfect life and then I will be living perfectly. <laughs> and, <laughs> You're like, soon this will be, yeah, I'll have figured yeah, it like, out. Oh, then I will transcend. And it's just like yeah, yeah. this whole thing of, I don't know, I, it made me realize then I, I basically went off the veganism wagon after a couple of years of it, which I know so many people were like shocked by. But I was just like, life is actually so short and, you know, you could be dead tomorrow. Um, yep. And like, why deny yourself the things in life that do bring you joy? Then I was also counter to the whole like addiction thing, which is a, you know, it's a very tricky line yeah. to walk. But so um, true. even like trying mm. to give up smoking, it's just, I, in fact, when I was in PATH, um, giving up everything, so I was sober off of everything. And then I said to my psychiatrist, oh, I think I'm going to give up smoking. She turned to me and she was like, don't you dare. She was like, <laughs> which is so weird for a doctor. I was like, it's like, you be happy about this. She's, she's like, like, no way. She's like, no, like, <sighs> that'll be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Like, don't mm. come at yourself and be like, right, I'm going to overhaul my life and cut out yep. all of the negative, all of the things that are bad that I do. Yep. And they'll be the perfect person because that's not mm. a livable life. That's not an enjoyable life. It's not sustainable. So then nope. you'll get to a point after a month of misery and you'll be like, fuck this throw caution to the wind and then you'll go back on everything and you'll but, binge um, get even binge worse hard so it's just like you know 10 fags like one in each exactly like <laughs> i'll go back on things worse than i started on so um yeah to just you know to allow yourself to live your life and to be happy and to allow yourselves the simple pleasures and mm. it is also still like you know safe and everything for you and um, so yeah, like, and that's thing I've been enjoying life a lot more since doing that of being like, I actually don't need to fit the archetype of the perfect person. 
you know, mm. and to not compare myself to, you know, when you see like wellness influencers and all this kind of stuff of being like, oh, well, she's actually sober for 10 years and she's vegan <laughs> and she has a whatever range of whatever. Like, fuck you, man. So, yeah. Exactly, and like, it okay, make it miserable, you... man. The social yeah. comparisons like that is social media is a nightmare for that, man, because it's always your it's showing you people that are higher up and whatever, like whatever you're do it's going to show you some random person that's better at it and you're going to feel bad about yourself and that's how that's the business model like exactly and that like i don't know so for example my roommate is also um he is sober maybe five years or something and yeah which is so amazing and then for me i I don't refer to myself as being fully sober because sometimes I will engage in recreational safe things, uh, the likes of mushrooms and things like that. But then I found myself feeling like I'm a fraud because people think Mm. that I'm, and I I, I try to never use the word sober when I talk about like my journey because it's not fully true It's not drinking. Yeah, it's like I don't drink and that's kind of what I say to people. And mm. they, whatever they want to do with that information, they turn it into whatever that I'm uh, full Russell Brand sober. <laughs> but um, <laughs> like levitating. Yeah, that I like meditate mm. for ten hours a day. But um, but yeah, then I would compare myself even to my roommate of being like, I'm not enough because even though I haven't drank in nearly six years, I'm not completely sober. And it's like mm. that I've learned you can't compare yourself to other people's journeys. You know that like there are some people who. You might mm-hmm. drink 10 pints in a weekend, but they don't smoke cigarettes and that's fucking class. And like, yep. whatever it is that helps get you through this chaos that is the world, like, allow yourself that. As long as it's not going mm-hmm. through these self-destructive patterns, which I haven't been. Um, yep. To like, let yourself live has been the thing I've learned the most, I think. 100%. That's something I've been using in terms of thinking, because I've struggled with that as well. You kind of oscillate between like self-indulgence and self-negation, where it's like, I'm going to do it all. And then you're like, I'm going to do nothing. It's kind of like yeah. one to the other. And something that I've really gotten from philosophy in the last while, which is the the importance of character, this idea of your character and how your character is, you know, how you're virtuous, how your vices. And I think if you're doing these things, as long as they're not really characters about good habits and bad habits, as long as you're not mm-hmm. filling up with bad habits, that are taking up your time and are getting bloated and bad. Like if it's not harming your character, it's okay. Fair enough. But if it is something that's habitual and it's damaging who you are, it's making you foolish. It's making you angry. It's making you behave in ways that are like, that aren't, you know, good character or what people would consider to be good character. Then, then you have a problem. Then it's something that's actually needs to be, because it is so easy to just be like, I'm going to do nothing. <laughs> and then you're like, well, I got to do everything. And like self-regulation is like the most mysterious and there's no class for it. Like you can't, in school, they're not like, this is what you do. It's, it's very vague. Like, but um, yeah. philosophy, it's virtue ethics. Yeah. I, I would virtue recommend ethics. for people checking out virtue ethics. I think it's a secular alternative for a lot of uh, kind of, in terms of other ethics that would be like, a bit more kind of dogmatic virtue ethics Mm -hmm. is quite like different cultures have it's eastern western um buddhism is a virtue ethics tradition so stoicism um aristotelian virtue ethics but to help you think about what what's good and what's bad i think is um i've gained a lot from it really focusing on like wisdom virtue i'm like if i drink pints it makes me foolish so i'm not pursuing wisdom so i shouldn't drink (laughs) pints But then again, if it didn't make me foolish, maybe it would be fine. But it does. And that is all the interesting. It's like the balance thing. And if I could have done balance, Mm. like that would have been great. But I know now in myself, like I'm aware enough of myself to know I can't do balance in that area of my life anyway. And some people are capable of that and that's class. But it's also the, I think the manifestation of, um, so something that I wasn't aware of and I know a lot of people in their own drinking and other like using habits aren't aware of. It's like when you're actually using a substance because mm-hmm. of something that's going on with you that you're not even that aware of, that you're like deeply sad. Or for me, I had like childhood trauma that I had not worked through. And I didn't realize that whenever that would be triggered that I'd be like, let's get fucking wrecked. Like I never saw mm-hmm. that little, um, I just see it as a like, no, I just have this impulse to go out and have loads of fun. This is deadly. I'm feeling great. But yep. that actually, when you, you know, start to pull that string back and trace it back, 
and it's actually something much more deeper and rooted so, um mm. that's definitely something as well i think in people's drinking you know if you can assess it with yourself to be like you know am i using this as something that's obstructive or because i don't want to deal with what's going on with me internally or do i actually just want to see my friends who have been ho- who are home i've been away for two years yep. and drink a rake of pints mm. oh, that's okay if you do yeah having to face that pain that resonates with me so much as well in terms of my own like problems in my house growing up and family and uh just wanting to get out and stay out for as long as possible because I didn't want to go back. And that was always, and then if that becomes a habit, you don't even realize that you're still acting out the same pattern of behavior that you had when you were a kid. Like, but there's no, mm-hmm. there isn't really another option. Like you have to turn and face it at some point. You have to start dealing with it. You have to kind of, the running away just ultimately it takes you further away. Like it doesn't, it doesn't get you any closer to feeling better. Um, yeah. I think quite the opposite. So I, I would encourage people to voluntarily start to confront those things for your own well being in the long run, because, you know, you're going to turn into a person in the future and yeah, you'll have to have dealt with it beforehand. Unfortunately, yeah. it's no good way. Like- it won't go away by not looking at it. That's when you have to feel it to heal it, isn't that what they say? And yeah. Inwards. Mm. A hundred percent. Like, uh, yeah, the more something, what was it? Problems avoided or problems multiplied? Conflict avoided is conflict multiplied. I don't know. Anyway, we've got enough catchphrases, but. Yeah, <laughs> think, amen, uh, sis. A hundred percent. Thank you so much, Anna. I think that's a good place to finish it. And hopefully we'll do this again for the trilogy when we come back. I can't wait. Even Part more three. lessons learned. <laughs> mm, more oh, insights. I'll be back on the pints. I'll be falling over in the back. And me too. Like. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. Oh, but thank you so much, man. Thank you, Hannah. Appreciate it.